I propose we start. We've got to stop exactly at 4.30 and to get Professor Grant Ferguson to, the, to his next meeting. Thank you all for joining this water talk. Um, we've got new batteries. That's why the sound is, is so loud. Um, I'll try to hold it a little bit further away from my face. So it's my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce Professor Grant Ferguson here um, today. Um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Civil, Geological and Environmental Engineering um, at the University of Saskatchewan, and he's also an associate member of the School of Environment and Sustainability there. Um, Grant is not a stranger to Waterloo. He did his bachelor's degree here at Waterloo in Earth Sciences under the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Sherry Schiff. Um, and then subsequently he did his PhD in civil engineering at the University of uh, Manitoba. His current research focuses on regional groundwater systems, the interplay between groundwater and energy resources, and groundwater protection at different scales from local to global. Um, Grant is the past president of the Canadian chapter of the International Associ Association of Hydrogeologists and founding chair of the Groundwater and Energy Commission of the same association. And today, Professor Grant Ferguson will talk about the race for, ground, for groundwater. Please join me in welcoming Grant to the floor. Thank you, Thank you Professor Brower. And, and yes, it's, uh, it's just reflecting a little bit. I think the last time I gave a talk in this building was about 19 years ago to this very week presenting work that I did in, in Sherry's lab as an undergrad. So it's good to be back. So today, what I want to talk to you about is, is some ideas around groundwater, and this is maybe a little bit conceptual, kind of high-level talk. We do have some synthesis uh, uh, I guess studies within here, and a little bit of original data that, that we'll speak to. But I, I guess to give you the, the angle on this, kind of why here and why now, uh, the shot in the background that we're looking at here, it looks an awful lot like some of the places we see in the United States that have seen groundwater depletion. This, this isn't Texas or Kansas or anywhere like that. This is near Lethbridge, Alberta. So my, I guess my angle on this and what I'm going to present here is we, we haven't seen groundwater exploitation to the extent we have in some places in the United States and other areas globally. But I think it's coming because if we look at this, this is the Old Man uh, Irrigation District. The surface water is fully allocated and they're already into using groundwater to a certain extent. So what I want to bring this back to, and I'm starting to feel a little bit old in the tooth, the whole 19-year thing was, was doing it for me. Um, let's see if this is I'm not advancing. I can do it the old-fashioned way here. Um, so this is going back to, to 2009, so 10 years ago. And I think I was vaguely involved with some of the consultations around this. Some of the others, uh, some others in this room may have been as well. So it was a Canadian Council of Academies report that came out in 2009. And basically, it was, it was a, a call to action. You know, we don't have problems. I can remember talking about Steve Hollish, uh, talking to Steve Hollish, who many of you may know, with uh, with uh, Oak Ridge's Marine Coalition, uh, working over in Toronto. He was he was part of uh, the group that put this together, and and his take on this was was one of Canada's biggest groundwater problems is we don't have these groundwater problems, right? We don't have this, you know, high plains depletion or whatever's going on in the Central Valley or something we can see from Grace in, in the northern India area. We don't have any of these things happening, but I think in terms of a strategic resource, we haven't really acted over the last 10 years like we, we think this is important. So I'm going to paint you a picture a little bit over the next few slides here to show where I'm going with this and why I think this might be, be important. So this idea that we've got areas like southern Alberta and maybe into Saskatchewan that are fully allocated for, for groundwater, other areas in the Okanagan that are getting to be that way, I guess more on the surface water stress than groundwater. Groundwater is kind of the next frontier. So what part of this story might be is if we look at where we're headed for kind of, I guess, projected northward shifts. So if we take our 1,200 degree day boundary uh, as just kind of a measure of where we might be able to have agriculture happening in Canada, all these areas are shifting way to the north, right? So if we look at this yellow line here, that's about where we're at right now. So kind of a line through the, through the prairies and kind of cutting across here to what we would consider arable land now. We're going to push those boundaries quite far to the north. So obviously there are logistics. I grew up in the Shield. I know that all of a sudden in Kenora District, we're not going to have wheat farms all over the place. But things are changing, and this shows up uh, in some of the other projections here. So I guess close to where I'm from here, and this will play a role in some of the other things I want to speak to as we go on in this talk. Uh, Kindersley, Alberta, or Kindersley, Saskatchewan, which is you know, about a two-hour drive uh, west from Saskatoon on the road to Calgary. 
if we look at our current heat units, I'm not an agricultural guy, but roughly speaking, you know, it's an ability of you know, how much heat do you have and what can you grow, not necessarily considering the water, which I think has got us into some of these problems around the world, but if we have heat, the idea seems to be that we can grow things. So Kindersley is going to move from 2260, which is relatively low. There's no one growing corn in, in central Saskatchewan right now, right? This is basically pasture land, a bit of wheat and canola in that area of, of the province. But what it is going to move up to is this number of 3235. That puts their corn heat units you know, into the future on that projected kind of ugly case scenario for uh, climate change into about what we see, say, in the Kitchener or London area of southern Ontario where we do grow corn, right? So it also, if you want to play time for space, right, all of a sudden Saskatchewan starts to look like South Dakota or Nebraska, right? So things are going to start to happen. And you know, I guess along with that, do we have the water to support this? So corn is kind of one of those poster child crops. We do see it moving into places like southern Manitoba, a little bit into Alberta, not so much into Saskatchewan yet, but you can see well, where that's going. Maybe that's more of kind of big, big chicken farms, big hog farms like we have seen move into Manitoba. So if we do see that, the question becomes, do we have enough water to support that? So if we look at how much water is required for a corn crop in a lot of these areas of Canada, we're looking at somewhere between maybe 300 upwards to maybe even 500 millimeters a year. Kindersley only gets like 340 millimeters of rain every year or precip. So that's not going to work. I mean, we're looking at irrigated agriculture and everywhere else where this has happened, this has meant going after groundwater. We do have regional aquifers in this part of the world. Are they sustainable? Probably not, looking at the amount of recharge we get through most of our prairie tills. We measure that in millimeters per year, not in hundreds of millimeters a year. So something's got to give here. So through some of my other work that I've been doing lately, we've been playing in, in areas where we have seen, uh, seen some depletion problems and big time water stresses. If anybody's been following what's going on in the Colorado River uh, and with their agreements between the various states involved, it's all over-allocated, Lake Mead is going dry, Arizona has been give, asked to give up something like half a million acre feet of water, which I mean, that doesn't mean too much to me, I don't think in acre feet. What it really means is they're giving up about a city of Calgary's annual use from, from Arizona. So where do, you, where do you fit that in, right? So it's not going to be Tucson and Phoenix that are giving up that, that water, it's going to be agriculture, right? So the story here that showed up in the New York Times last summer, Essentially, the story was a family had moved there from Pennsylvania. They set up shop. They had a nice family home, a small acreage, and then all of a sudden their well went dry. Well, what happened? Big agriculture was next, next door, and they were looking, to, you know, looking for water for irrigation. And in some of these areas, outside of these active management areas in Arizona, it's basically deepest well winds. So that's sort of what we're looking at in places like Arizona, Similar things were happening in, in uh, the Central Valley of California. So there's definitely some, I guess there's some social issues that go along with this, you know, industry versus, versus uh, individual homeowners and small families. And, and then I guess there's the whole sustainability thing. How is this going to work? So this brings apart, brings a lot of other issues, right? So I'll paint a bit of a picture about where this is headed in terms of what groundwater sustainability might look like. And, and sure, we've all seen the GRACE satellites or the, the images that have come out from that. You know, we can monitor this. We've seen the metrics, like you know, if you pump more than the recharge, which may or may not be correct. I'll talk about that as we go on. But, but ultimately, in some of these places in the arid southwest and in other areas around the globe where we have seen groundwater depletion, it essentially becomes how deep can we drill a well? You know, and, and who has the biggest pockets? And they're often the ones, we, ones who win, right? So that might be a financial constraint. It could also be a water quality constraint that eventually you drill deeper and deeper and you're going to come up with water that's too saline or it has some other water quality constraint, hydrocarbons, metals, some other issue. How quickly is it going to come back? Like I said, most of these areas, if we think about what goes on in Saskatchewan, two millimeters a year, maybe 10 millimeters a year going through prairie tills, if that's what, what you're interested in, if that's your metric, which might not be a perfect one, but Certainly suggest that if you have low recharge rates, low rates of replenishment, that could be an issue. And then the other thing I'll touch on here, which I think is probably our bigger problem, and certainly in Western Canada, and it shows up in other parts of North America, is that we've got other people, other industries that are using either the water or the pore space, and how does that interact with, 
with everything else that's going on. So specifically, the energy industry is something I'll focus on as I go through this talk. So we can look at this, and we can say, well, we've definitely got this sort of top-down pressure on, on groundwater resources. So one of those is, is we know we've seen depletion of groundwater resources, dropping water tables. So this comes out of the GRACE satellite uh, data, some, some of Jay Family Eddy's work. And we can see that that's pretty common throughout uh, some of the major agricultural areas of the world, like the Southern Plains and the North China Plains, the Central Valley. Most of these have seen pretty drastic depletion over the length of the GRACE satellite mission. So essentially, the solution has been, as I, as I pointed to, it's to chase that water table downwards, right, and go and drill deeper and deeper wells, and you know, the one with the biggest uh, bank account might win. But we've also seen some other issues uh, that, well, I guess, to paint a picture of what that looks like, say, in the United States, groundwater depletion in, in cubic kilometers, so putting that in fairly big numbers, and we can see some of our you know, major players here, the Central Valley, the High Plains Aquifer, up through the Dakota, you know, Mississippi Embayment. So there's depletion in a lot of areas, and there's Arizona that I talked about earlier, that it's only going to get worse as we tap out surface water supplies. So we have to come up with some other uh, way of doing this. So that's been one way we've looked at it, just you know, how much water have we used, very, very, I guess, physical in nature. We've also got other constraints on this, right? So another article from the New York Times, and I know others uh, ha have worked on this issue uh, here at the University of Waterloo. So this was uh, tagged as kind of rural America's flint. So nitrate quality problems are pretty per pervasive throughout uh, most agricultural areas of the world. And we can see that in, in this recent study that showed up in scientific reports. It's a little bit hard to read here, the, the scale, but essentially, you know, you can see up through the, the central high plains and into the Canadian prairies, we've got high Vados zone nitrates all over the place, and, and it's only getting worse as we kind of march through time from 1925, 1950, 1975, and, you know, the most current data is, you know, all of Europe, a good chunk of Central Asia, and most of our intensively farmed agricultural areas of, of North America. So we've got water that's being drawn out and it's not there anymore, and a lot of what's there in our agricultural areas has been contaminated, right? So if it's got nitrate, chances are it might have pesticides or some other contaminants that, that aren't so great to have it around. So this has been, been painted out kind of in some of my recent research here that you know, it's got this kind of pore space competition, right? So a lot of people looked at this top-down stress, you know, different people with different wells, you know, different land uses that may or may not contaminate water supplies. But the other side that maybe hasn't been examined so much, and there are, I guess, natural constraints, and then there's industrial constraints to this, are what's going on at the bottom, right? So in my world out in, in Western Canada, and, and certainly we've seen issues with this, thinking about what's gone on in the Marcellus Shale, there's certainly old legacy issues in the Michigan Basin, which uh, clip part of southwestern uh, Ontario, that we've got all these things going on. And, and obviously, hydraulic fracturing has been in the press, you know, gas land and all these things, and, and it's gotten a lot of attention, probably rightly so, just to figure out, is it a big deal or, or, is, it it, or is it not? But what we've been focused on through a lot of uh, my research that, that's been going on through the group of students that I work with uh, at the University of Saskatchewan and at the University of Arizona has been, been uh, kind of looking more broadly at the oil industry. There's a lot of other things going on, and some of them aren't entirely oil industry, right? But we've got old abandoned orphan wells. We've got injection of various fluids, whether that's for you know, uh, hydraulic fracturing, disposal, enhanced oil recovery. There's a lot of things going on in the subsurface. So, and that's all kind of connected by this, uh, this area in between. I think this was Dick Jackson's term initially, or maybe it was John Cherry's, I can't remember which. But this idea of the intermediate zone, right? We've got, maybe it was even Dick, or maybe it was uh, Mar Maurice, I don't know. It was one of you guys, right? So this, this area in between that, that we don't know much about, right? We know what's going on with oil and gas. There's not necessarily the data we want, but there's at least sampling opportunities, and there's some data. And then we do OK. I'll say OK, because there's a lot of things we don't know about shallow groundwater. I feel like I'm in constant fights with provincial regulators and, and various other uh, players to see if they'll free up data and actually look behind, let me look behind the curtain in what's uh, already a pretty fuzzy picture. But this other area in between, we really don't know much about. So that's going to be a real challenge. And I guess a focus of this talk is, is we kind of look at well, what, what's down there, right? Because we've got 
these other industrial competitors for this, this water and pore space. And then we've got what I think is probably the bigger issue for going forward into the future, which is the, the groundwater resource. So one of the things that, that uh, my group has looked at and, and led to a, a paper that was published, I guess, Jen McIntosh and I in Arizona and uh, Scott Jasheko and Deb Perone at UCSB that we put together kind of the synthesis study just to see, well, what does this actually look like? And like I said, we've, we've had a few uh, fights in CFs and we've been trying to put together the Canadian story and I do have students working on that, but this is one thing where uh, the US does have a leg up on us. You know, as much as we do like to complain and think that we're better than the United States in a lot of ways, in terms of data availability for things like groundwater, the US is quite advanced relative to us, right? For example, in Saskatchewan, they won't release the data to me unless I go through a freedom of information request, right? It's all behind protect protection of privacy that somehow I'm gonna see that some farmer has nitrates in as well and they're gonna, you know, their property value is gonna tank. So I'm not sure if that's a valid approach, but that's what they're sticking with anyways. So we did find an interesting relationship here, and, and this is kind of serendipitous in a way, and, and other areas kind of got the short end of the stick. So it turns out that if you are looking to drill deeper and deeper wells, this is something they get away with in California, in Arizona, and it's just a product of what the flow systems look like. They've got younger sediments in some of these areas. They've got a lot of topography to drive flow systems, so they end up having fresh water with relatively low residence times from some of the other kind of age dating that, that we've been able to reference in some of the other uh, papers and follow-up studies we've been working on. On the other hand, there, there are areas that either they are in trouble, so if we look at, say, the Anadarko Basin, Sedgwick, so this whole area through here would be the, the High Plains Aquifer, what we used to refer to as the Ogallala. There's a lot of salt in those basins at depths, evaporite units, and it turns out that beneath the High Plains Aquifer, you can't drill any deeper. There's nowhere to go, right? So if you talk to certain people there, it's, it's game over. There's no more irrigation water that we have to think of something else to do. On the other hand, that might also mean that some of the agriculture that was going on, on in this area, that as climate changes and, and uh, our corn heat degree days or whatever we want to call those, uh, shift northwards, that whatever was going on down here might all of a sudden be going on up here, right? So those are issues that we're gonna to need to think about it. Along with that, we also looked at, at some of these issues related to, uh, I guess, the interface between uh, not just fresh groundwater and, and more saline groundwater, but where brackish groundwater is. So there's something like 600 municipalities in, in the United States that are already using brackish water through desalination techniques. So that is a, what might be a critical resource. There are salt tolerant crops that we might be able to work with in some of these areas. But this also gives us an idea of, of the interface, right? How much of a buffer we have between some of these deeper salt producing areas, you know, at depth where you pull up water that's, you know, 10,000 milligrams per liter or in many cases a lot more. So some of these basins we've been working in like the Paradox Basin down in Utah or the Williston Basin in, in Saskatchewan, North Dakota, the salinity of some of these basins is like 300,000 milligrams per liter, right? These are not usable for much of anything, right? But on the other hand, there are, there are some of these areas where we do have a fair amount of buffer here. So this betrays some of the local complexity. So this is getting into some of these areas of, of Arizona and, and California that it's nuanced. We can't just say, well, everything in, in this one basin, the Central Valley is good to go. We can drill deep wells all over the place. There's hits and misses here, so this is actually going into the USGS uh, brackish water database to see just what that might look like, right? So with everything in hydrogeology, it's, it's nice to paint these big pictures at the continental or global scale, but the hydrogeologist work is, is never gonna be done. I always kind of joke to my students, right? We could figure out the theory of everything and string theory and all this, and we'd still be out there drilling wells tomorrow because it's, it's too complicated, right? We're not gonna figure it out that way. So I'm not, saying we've solved all the world's problems. But, but what does come across as interesting is if we look at where we've drilled, so if we look up, up here, right, we've got, I guess, our median well depths. So this would be, the, in the light blue, our median well depths, and the dark blue is our 95th percentile. So if we look across all these basins, we can see that there are a lot of basins where we've got a whole lot more to drill until we hit this you know, kind of interface between the light purple and, and the dark purple which is our transition from a TDS of 3,000 milligrams per liter, which in this case we're calling fresh. I think that's maybe a little bit generous for fresh. If I was all of a sudden getting 3,000 milligram per liter water out of my tap at home, I'd be a little bit upset. 
but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's ametric, and we can see that there are areas where we've got a lot of space to go. Most of these are kind of you know, mountainous areas like the Antler Foreland in, in the western United States and Green River Basin and all these. So these are kind of butted up against some of the mountains there. But then if we look somewhere a little bit closer to home here, like say the Michigan Basin, if they ever had extensive groundwater mining in the Michigan Basin, which we're sitting on the edge of here in, in, in southwestern Ontario, there's really nowhere to go, right? We can't drill these you know, 800 meter deep wells like what they have been in places in California. So that's something to be, be cognizant of here, right? So the, the other thing that, that we've figured out here is, is based on some of these older studies, and you know, there have been some of these papers that they've come out in, in nature or, or science or whatever, and I'm beating up a little bit on, on Tom Gleason because I have worked with him in the past and we continue to work together, but some of these arbitrary things where we'll just, we'll add up and we'll guesstimate the amount of water on Earth and we use this 2,000 meter depth as, as some sort of metric for pore space we can use. If you actually start to look at salinity and water chemistry constraints, we've actually got a lot less water than that. So whatever your textbook said about, you know, that groundwater was X percent of the global supply, it still does really dwarf some of those other uh, water uh, sources out there, like rivers and lakes and whatnot, but it's not nearly as big as, as what we thought it would because we come up with a number that's probably around 800 meters until you start to get into water that's too saline to drink. So the other part that I promised was we've got salinity, water chemistry constraints on this. And here we can see just how variable some of those things are. So just kind of putting those things in terms of binned, uh, binned water chemistry by depth for, uh, for TDS, which is a pretty gro gross uh, metric of water quality here. But nevertheless, no one wants to be running around drinking water that's you know, beyond this, this gray bar here, which is our you know, transition from fresh to brackish and brackish to saline. So a lot of this water, if you look at, say, the Anadarko Basin in Oklahoma or the Appalachian Basin uh, to the southeast of us here, you're into water that's you know, seven or eight times as salty as the ocean. Right? No one wants to drink that. So we can see you know, where the water wells sit, and, and they're more or less, I mean, there's no, not too, much, not too uh, far to go in these basins until we're going to run out of space to drill. On the other hand, what we can point out here is, is some of the, I guess, the hype about what's been going on in the Marcellus Shale about hydraulic fracturing. Unless we have some pathway, which I'm sure Maurice could talk about this more later on, it could be uh, poor well completions, you know, uh, orphan wells, bad casings. Fault seems to be maybe not as, as, uh, as good a candidate as, as what we've, we thought it was previously, but you've got a lot of depth to move through here, right? So our so-called intermediate zone here would be this, you know, almost, you know, 1,500 meters, getting towards a mile for those of you who don't think in metric, right? That's, that's a lot of rock to move through. On the other hand, we, we do look at some other areas, right? The Barnett Shale, so this would be, say, beneath Dallas-Fort Worth in Texas, that they're not using this water down here, but whatever might happen, right? Dallas grows again, or they need some other uh, water supply that they could potentially be using this water resource, but they're already hydraulically fracturing the Barnett Shale right up against it, right? So there might be other water chemistry constraints around here. Maybe it's organics or metals or something like that. But we are moving right up against these water resources in some areas. If you look at these ones, it looks even worse, right? So as I said before, uh, the Michigan Basin. So we've got very shallow water wells. And there hasn't been a need to drill really deep water wells in most of the Michigan, Michigan Basin. But the Antrim Shale is, is right up against that, right? It's not that deep. And hydraulic fracturing has been happening you know, within a few hundred meters of the surface. So depending on what your aquitards look like, where you've got old well casings, old wildcat wells that people have forgot about, that, that might be an issue. So the, the other story here, which is more of a geochemistry story, right? the reason we actually have uh, very shallow uh, natural gas that they're going after in that part of the Michigan Basin is that's actually biogenic gas for the most part in those shallow wells. But that's a story for another day. And if you look at the Wind River Basin, uh, we can see similar things. So this actually goes back to the story of the pavilion case where they did actually find fracture, hydraulic fracturing fluids migrate up through an old well casing into farm wells. And the reason why that sort of thing was possible, well, not only because of poor well completions, but because what was going on here in terms of hydraulic fracturing was in fairly close, close, close proximity to uh, uh, domestic and farm wells. And again, Powder River Basin is kind of the same thing. They're actually looking at, at coal bed methane development in that area where 
looking at fairly shallow coals. Although much of that is, is not happening anymore because the price of gas doesn't support that. So you can see that these, these are happening all over the place. This is uh, work by Dom DiGiulio, who was actually involved in the pavilion uh, study and, is, and later working at, at Stanford. Uh, but essentially we see unconventional oil and gas wells all over the United States that are producing brackish water. So looking at uh, USGS data and other EPA data that we have actually got gas being produced with relatively fresh water, right? So it might not be that those are, I guess, water resources that you could use easily because they've got hydrocarbons in them, but it does show the proximity of what might be going on there. And then on top of that, and we do have similar things happening in Canada, probably not so much in Ontario because of the lack of a large oil industry like what we see in Western Canada, but we do see issues around uh, what we call aquifer exemptions in the United States. So this would be where we're injecting fluids into aquifers that somewhere else in the region, that aquifer is used for a potable water supply. It's considered a, 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 a drinking water supply. So generally less than 10,000 milligrams per liter, often in many cases less than that. But there have been various fights that have gone on you know, in terms of arguing that that water will never be used because of financial constraints. There's no one living in the area, et cetera, et cetera. And there's actually been different court battles. I think EPA decided to take in Canada's task over uh, a few wells that were injecting into the Madison Aquifer in, in Wyoming back a few years ago. And the story there was that the Madison Aquifer was deep and no one could possibly use it. And they expected it to be saline and full of all kinds of one, other wonderful goodies. But when they actually drilled those wells, they came up with a TDS value that was around 1,500 milligrams per liter which is better than some other uh, farm wells in the area. So there are some of these issues out there. So I guess there's all these issues going on. And I guess what, what I wanted to do in, in my research group and some of the other people that we've been working with is, is we wanted to redirect some of these issues, right? So thinking about groundwater as a strategic resource, we don't have large scale groundwater depletion in Canada. There's a few minor areas, I know there's a couple wells in southeastern Saskatchewan that, that were pumped pretty heavily, and I know there's other areas that are stressed in, in parts of BC and whatnot, but it's not like something that you can see from the GRACE satellite data. We do have the whole issue of hydraulic fracturing. I think hydraulic fracturing, I mean, it's, it's been difficult, right? There have been a few review papers that have come out lately, and they'll cite like 20 instances where they think maybe this happened and there was a contaminant incident, and then you start to kind of chase those references back and you realize that's not really a hydraulic fracturing impact. It was associated with an unconventional oil and gas development, but that was a surface spill, or that was a bad well casing, or it was some other issue. And, and so you can take that one of two ways. You can say either, oh good, hydraulic fracturing, nothing to worry about, or you could Think about what that really means is it's like, oh, well, the same issues that are happening with hydraulic fracturing, they're common to the rest of the oil and gas industry, which hasn't seen this level of scrutiny. The oil and gas industry gets away with a lot, especially we see it in Western Canada. So I'm not saying that we've seen widespread impacts, but if you look at, say, the level of scrutiny that nuclear waste uh, repositories are subjected to, or other uh, projects, mining projects, or maybe carbon sequestration, the permitting process for a lot of the oil and gas developments is very much cookie cutter, right? It's a two week review process and things just go. So if we think about that, you know, hydraulic fracturing has been happening for 10 to 15 years with horizontal multi-stage fracks. I know there's older vertical fracks and, and whatnot. There's an older history to that. If you look at conventional oil and gas production, right, it goes back into the 1800s, right? We've got wells in, in southwestern Ontario down near Sarnia that have been going for that long. It's not quite as old uh, in, in western Canada, but certainly we've got a long history. So that kind of makes us think, well, what are we missing here? Are we really bad at monitoring things? And how much of our resource have we potentially lost? I don't have the answer to that. That's going to be a multi-million dollar uh, research program that I'm still scheming to figure out how to fund that, or maybe there's some fancy isotope or something else that'll help resolve all that, but we're still searching. So we'll just go through this and, and think about what some of that might look like. So some of this is, is known, right? We've got a lot of issues, and this is kind of bread and butter for consulting companies and, and other companies doing cleanup. 
Uh, so I was this unfortunate US, uh, U of S professor that was dumb enough to speak to the media last summer. Uh, but uh, they came up with this number. I was unaware of this database that you know, all of a sudden this reporter said, well, there's 121 produced water, salt water leaks from the oil industry dating back to 2017. And we chased that back and we realized it's a lot worse than that. We had close to 20,000 leaks of either oil or produced water, most of which are brines. You can kind of see what that looks like here, right? So oil will at least biodegrade and you can sort of clean that up. If you spill brines in these concentrations, I don't think anything's ever going to grow here again, right? And that's fairly common uh, that we, we see these things, right? They can be picked out on Google Earth in various parts of Western Canada and Texas and, and whatnot, right? So there's something like 20,000 of these spills that have happened over the last two decades, which is kind of horrifying, but okay, so we've got an issue there. It's known, it's a legacy issue. We're dealing with it. The scarier one here is, is this. I, I don't necessarily believe this number, but I'll throw it out here because it's a big number and it's kind of impressive. So if you talk to certain people, you'll come up with this $100 billion liability for abandoning wells properly. I think the actual Auditor General report for Alberta tags that somewhere closer to 10 billion. I know we've got what's been uh, estimated to be a $4 billion uh, liability in Saskatchewan. And I saw just over the past week that the BC Oil and Gas Commission came out and, and labeled uh, their problem there or the increase in the liability there over the past couple of years with the increase of the number of suspended wells at somewhere around two billion. So it's a lot of money, right? So these are issues that aren't going away. So I always kind of convey that to my students, right? They all want to go off to work for Syncrude or Cameco or whatever and make big money in the mines. Yeah, but this is probably the gift that's gonna keep on giving to us in, in uh, environmental and earth sciences. So thinking about this, there's just a big mess here, right? So, I mean, there's, there's what I presented before in terms of that kind of race for porosity, but we think about all the different things going on. It's pretty busy if you look at a basin like the Western Canada Century Sedimentary Basin. And it just got me and, and some of my colleagues a point, especially to Jennifer McIntosh in Arizona. We've been working on a lot of these things lately. Um, just in terms of the fluid budgets and what goes round and round in some of these uh, sedimentary basins. So a lot of it's been, been thought you know, that, that hydraulic fracturing will really drive some of the fluid flow. But once we got digging into it, we figured out that that's really not the story here. So if you look at what's been going round and round in Western, sediment, Western Canada sedimentary basin, there's actually an excess of three billion cubic meters in the sedimentary basin, right? So I already pointed out that we don't get much for groundwater recharge in Western Canada. But if you spread this out over the entire Western Canada sedimentary basin, it would give you a few millimeters, right? So it's, it's not insignificant. And some of these, like if you believe Jim Henry's study that he's done you know, over and over and over in his career through those Cretaceous shales and the tills and whatnot, that we're not pushing any fluids through those. On the other hand, we are cycling it through with some of these uh, activities of the oil and gas industry. So Western Canada is not alone. The records for these are all different time periods because oil and gas records are a mess. We've been trying to go through some of those to try and figure out just what's, what's been going on. The record for the Permian, so this is some of Bridget Scanlon's work from uh, down in Texas. I think this is only a 10 year period. So if you want to look at what was going on in some of these other basins in Texas or, or California or some of these places, it would be substantially more. On the other hand, if we compare that to, uh, this is one of uh, Abner Vengosh's studies, uh, his group at Duke, this is, the total of uh, movement of, of water for hydraulic fracturing since the beginning of uh, the, the industry, more or less, in the early 2000s. And it's, it's kind of a drop in the bucket, right? So if you look at, you know, this is, this is all of the United States, and we've had double that or more move in Western Canada. So the conventional oil industry is, is probably a bigger, bigger story. And I'll explain why that is going forward here. So just to give you an idea of, of what's been going on at depth, and most of this is down below, and we do have wonderful Cretaceous shales and should act as a good aquachart in Western Canada. But part of our problem is that we don't really know that, right? So we've got these studies, you know, the Alberta Energy Regulator, Tony LeMay has done great work and says, well, we can map that out, and if we can find a good aquachart, we can put that boundary a little higher in the sequence, but it, the rule without any data is, you know, if you're below 600 meters, you're fine. Do whatever you want. Saskatchewan, I'm not sure why we haven't updated things. Usually we copy Alberta. Our rule is 1,000 feet. Why we're still working in feet is 
unclear to me, but anyway, so all these dots should be down below that depth, but we haven't really done the legwork on that, right? So in terms of permitting one of these wells, it ends up being a short review period on the order of weeks. You install the well, and the monitoring requirements are basically annual pressure and the initial uh, reporting has to file some, some geophysical logs to make sure you've got, got your cement bonds and a good seal and whatnot. So the other side of that would be that that's current regulations, and some of these are much older wells that have been retrofitted, and how they're behaving is, is I guess, anybody's guess. So we've got a lot of water that's moved around in the basin. So if we look at how that works, I mean, some of this is, you know, it just goes round and round. If you look at the old Leduc Reservoir or the Nescu, it's, it's basically they dump the water back in the reservoir it came from, you try and chase out more oil. And then we've got some of my other favorite aquifers, which are more related to the potash production, uh, disposing of waste brines that we've dumped a whole pile in, in the Deadwood and also the Interlake, uh, which has actually caused some induced seismicity, we think, but that's a story for another day. So there's, there's all these things going on. Like I said, there's, there's a bit of a, a competition for some of these pore space. So we've got oil and gas, and then we're trying to protect our, our water resources up top. And then we've got these other emerging, I guess, energy projects, which should be better you know, in terms of, of addressing uh, other issues like greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got the Aquastore uh, carbon capture and storage project. So this is a boundary dam at Estevan, so the old coal-fired power plant is stripping off CO2, and we're injecting that down into uh, the dead wood here, which is also uh, where the potash industry buries the dead bodies, so to speak, in terms of waste brine. And then we also have this. So uh, I've worked on and off on geothermal energy projects for years and years here, and I was starting to feel like I was studying perpetual motion, but I think we finally got something on the go. So this is Kirsten Marsha's group out of Saskatoon. We drilled, uh, or they drilled rather, what is the deepest uh, hole ever in Saskatchewan down to the Precambrian basement. And it looks like they're gonna make a go of this and produce geothermal energy. So the catch with both the geothermal project and the carbon sequestration project, to have those make a real difference in terms of you know, our energy mix and addressing greenhouse gas emissions, it's not just gonna be these two projects, right? We're gonna have to do these over and over again. And how does that play with you know, the brine disposal from, from the potash industry, from disposal of co-produced fluids from the oil industry? How does that fit with all those uh, wells that are already in place that we might not know how they're abandoned? So one of the things that, that we've been thinking about is well, how does this play out, right? So we've been thinking a lot about, you know, about hydraulic fracturing and trying to reframe this discussion here to bring it out into a, I guess, a more fulsome discussion of what the energy industry and groundwater would look like here. So if we think about what that actually looks like in terms of the pressure increase and the duration, right? Because if you think about that in terms of Darcy's law, that's what's gonna drive flow. We need a, a difference in hydraulic head, and we need a time, and then we can have transport distance, right? So if we think about hydraulic fracturing, typically a job is gonna be on the order of days, right? So these are just kind of composite plots that are dreamt up based on uh, different, different uh, I guess, plots we've found out in various databases in the literature, but hydraulic fracturing is days, right? The pressure increase is, is big, it's extreme, we're trying to break that rock, but it doesn't last all that long. If we think about the pressure increase that might happen, say, at an enhanced oil recovery project or a disposal well, the pressure is going to be you know, down an order of magnitude or so. But these things, I mean, some of these things are operating for decades. So if you think about that just in terms of kind of a Darcy's Law type plot, so if you think about the pressure increase being the hydraulic head term in Darcy's Law, and then if you're going to have some distance traveled, time is the other important part, right? So if we think about some of our important hydraulic fracturing plays are the, the ones that we often think about, the Marcellus Shale, the Horn River, the Woodford, where we're seeing pressure increases on the order of you know, 40, 50 MPA, something like that. It's gonna be a lot lower for, for some of our other projects here where we're just looking at disposal wells, uh, whether this is, is for brine disposal for say solution mining, or for something like uh, just enhanced oil recovery. But these things could go on for decades, right? So if you think about how that plays out in terms of a Darcy's Law type thing, if you do find an old rotten well casing, a fault, a window in an aquitard, it's gonna be these things that haven't received nearly the same amount of press, right? So it's those legacy issues and the boring old oil and gas industry that has been chugging along for, for decades. 
that are going to be the problem. So this was actually an interesting one that, that we stumbled across uh, looking through some oil and gas uh, databases on SPE. Uh, we found this case study, and then by doing a Google search, we found this, which was uh, labeled as the scariest real estate advertisement on Craigslist, which is actually kind of scary, right? So this whole area is, is a mess. This place down in, in Kentucky. But it was the one area where we could see this kind of smoking gun type thing that I think if you actually got in there and could work with the oil industry and get a little bit of money to sample some key locations, this is what you'd see. So what they had in this situation is they had a water supply well that they were using for an enhanced oil recovery project. So you had a drawdown cone associated with that, drawing water towards the well. And then they were injecting it down into this, this oil sands, they were calling it. So sandstone that had uh, heavier oil in it that they were trying to produce. And what happened is it, it went across and it shot up through an old leaky well casing. And you had what looked like basically a breakthrough curve that you'd expect for a, a well uh, injection producer type pair. So it, salinity ticked up to it's what we call here brackish, you know, from what was initially a freshwater supply. So we've got salt water contamination of, of this uh, water supply field. So I guess coming back to this issue, right, I mean, it essentially it comes down to, to this. What's, what's in the in-between, right? We don't have a good feel for what this is. And I haven't done it up here, right? There's been, I guess, a focus on chemistry that I presented here, a little bit on pressures, but I guess the big part to build into this, and we've got students who are, who are starting to look at this for Western Canada and a few other uh, key sedimentary basins. Uh, and this would be the idea of, well, what, what's actually in between? Right, so part of the in-between thing is, well, if you do have that nice aquitard there, well, you better start going to look for those leaky wells or some other pathway. The other thing that we've seen, and we've got data that hints at this in, down in Utah, in, in an area we've been working in, and there's other instances which kind of hint at this in Western Canada, that if you actually do create a pressure increase through a disposal well or through hydraulic fracturing, you're not gonna see what's injected there, whether that's you know, co-produced water or whatever fracking fluids, that's not what's going to be pushed out to those water supply wells first. What you're going to see is what's in this zone in between. So those brackish waters that may also contain hydrocarbons, heavy metals, whatever. But we have a really poor view of, of what that, that looks like. So this is from the USGS uh, Produced Waters database, uh, matched together with uh, the brackish water database, which is, is kind of a composite of, of the produced water and uh, a lot of the USGS uh, this shallow potable groundwater monitoring that they do. And we can see that there's some holes in the data, right? So if we look at, say, the Williston uh, Basin data, so North Dakota, and there's a bit of Saskatchewan and Montana data in here, we can see all the shallow drinking water supplies are up here. The Bakken's down here somewhere around there, you know, it dips, and there's a few other oil producing reservoirs and whatnot. But if you actually wanted to figure out what's in between, there's very little data, and it looks even worse if you look at it spatially. So that's pretty common in a lot of these basins. We can see that show up in the Powder River Basin, the Anadarko Basin down in Oklahoma, the Michigan Basin, there's a bit of a gap there. So it, it's difficult to see what you're actually looking at. So just to finish up here, I'll kind of draw your attention to, to some of the issues you know, with deeper groundwater and how that connects back into the hydrologic system. So I know this is one of those things that I guess I struggle with as, as, a, as a hydrogeologist, that, that there's been a whole thrust what we've seen over the last 20 years or so, give or take, to, towards groundwater, surface water interaction and integrated modeling. And these things are great ideas, but they don't necessarily need to apply everywhere. And then there's other hiccups to this, right? That you can get the flows right in some cases, but if what you're really interested in is fluxes of different uh, chemical elements, that you're going to have to pay attention to some of those smaller water fluxes that might really punch above their weight when we're talking about brines or other strange and wonderful things that might come from depth. So think about what those might be. I mean, my favorite here, and worked on this on and off with Steve Grasby from the Geological Survey of Canada for a number of years, is brines in the, in the Williston Basin. And those all discharge into Lake Winnipegosis. And we've actually got these weird little marine ecosystems that show up in Lake Winnipegosis that are equivalent to things that would happen up in uh, Hudson Bay. The invertebrates are, are quite similar. The story is always given as like hitchhikers on geese or something, which I suppose maybe that makes sense. Said so we've been working in the Paradox Basin in, in, in Utah, which I mean, this is actually uh, 
a brine interceptor well here, so they collect brine that would otherwise discharge to the Colorado River because the majority of salt loading to the Colorado River comes on this one small area of the Dolores River. So just through this, this area here in the Paradox Valley, and there's a couple of my uh, students from Arizona that I work with there. So the story there that we come up with is, is this is based on older USGS research and, and our research seems to confirm that and we're coming up with a few different isotopic measurements to try and prove just where this is coming from and, and why this happens. But this, this load here of about uh, 10 billion cubic, or 10 billion kilograms per year of sodium chloride discharge over this one stretch and uh, kind of a bit of a joke because it's, it's not with the Colorado River any, anymore, but it should be like one 200th of the global chloride flux of the ocean should come from this one like 10 kilometer stretch of this tributary to the Colorado River. Because the punchline to that is it's not a flux of the ocean because the Colorado River doesn't discharge the ocean so much anymore. But, but there are a number of places like this. If you look around the, the planet, right, those brine springs in, in uh, Lake Winnipegosis and others in Manitoba, those are equivalent to over 1% of the world's chloride cycle. And the Permian Basin is, is a few percent uh, overall. And, at the same time, there's other strange things, right? Just in terms of how the hydrogeology works out, there's huge salt beds throughout the Michigan Basin. I think people probably know that with the salt mines in Goderich and whatever else. If you look at, uh, I guess, the, the inflow and the outflow, say, to, uh, you know, along the St. Mary's River, which, which has very little salt in it, and then what would come out you know, as that comes out of Lake uh, Huron on the other side, if you can look at older measurements that don't have a whole lot of road salt or whatever else in there, there's no chloride coming out of the Michigan Basin. It's all sealed off with aquatarts. So kind of a, just an interesting story. So I mean, yeah, and then there's all kinds of other things, right? If you think about you know, Paleozoic brines, there's been a whole uh, lot of work done in, in Appalachia on this in terms of how these things may or may not be connected. I'm not sure we have good hydrogeological models in terms of flow to, to describe a lot of this. There's a lot of ideas, but I think there's a lot of uh, latitude to do this sort of thing. Uh, again, thinking about some of these other, you know, the need to integrate or not to integrate. I think there's a lot of open questions about how we do that and, and what that actually means in terms of groundwater sustainability, right, to build that all in. So this is work out of Reed Maxwell's group uh, with Laura Condon, and we've had some interesting conversations with, with Laura about how, the, how this all might work. And one of the interesting stories that we've put, we were kind of attracted to this, or I was, is that the bottom boundary for this kind of continental scale model was 102 meters. How'd you come up with that, Laura? It's like, well, we originally had a two meter soil layer in par flow, and then we asked Tom Gleason for data, and he gave us up to 100 meters. So, okay, well, seems kind of arbitrary, so can we do anything with that? So those are kind of open questions in terms of how we would deal with that. Because I guess one of our things that we think about what's going on in a lot of places in North America, especially glaciated areas in North America, whether that's Southern Ontario or the prairies, Look at uh, some of Mark Persson's old work here that you know, we've got our ice sheet over here and all these sedimentary basins and the associated regional groundwater flow systems, intertill aquifers and whatever else. We've, we know we've got Pleistocene water in there, right? And you know, Scott Jeschekel and I, we went and looked at the isotopes a few years ago and it, and it seems to consistently map out. And we know there's old water in there. There's a larger story in just terms of how old, but whether it's 10,000 years old from the last gasp of the glaciation or if it's you know, 1.5 million years old in the earlier part of the glaciation, the point is it's not gonna be renewed next year, right? There's gotta be something else going on. Uh, at the same time, that alone is not a good metric for are things safe or not, because that whole story I told with old leaky gas wells, that seems to be happening with water wells and a variety of other things that are going on because you know, this, this work that Scott DeShecco led and, and myself and a lot of others contributed to, that we see that we, we can see old data, whether that's in very negative oxygen 18 or deuterium uh, values, radiocarbon that says it's old water, and then all of a sudden you find tritium in it. So how does that work, right? So there's, there's some mixing of this, and I guess we, we do have a good example of this from, from uh, the Regina area. You know, we see these values here that we would normally interpret as you know, ice age type waters. And there's a mixing trend with, with uh, waters that are young and have these high tritium unit values. So bad well casings, I don't think there's that much water that was used for drilling stuck in these wells. They've probably been all developed and pumped and whatnot. 
is there some story with, you know, the aquifer was pumped heavily for a while and it induced groundwater surface water interactions, sucking in modern water. It's not clear, but, but that sort of thing, it, it has been pointed to. So work from the USGS has kind of suggested that, you know, eventually, right, it's not just recharge, it's how much recharge you can capture and maybe how much surface water you can suck in. And, and a lot of the aquifers in the United States that have been depleted, the amount of water pumped from the aquifers is a lot more than what's missing from the aquifers, right? So some of that is recharge that should have been discharged to some stream, and some of that is reversal. So maybe that's what we're seeing in some of these areas. So it's more complicated than just saying, well, we got two millimeters of recharge, and if that was your metric, no one would use any groundwater in Western Canada, right? So we could all just go home and no more agriculture once we're done with our surface water. So on top of all this, and I don't have the answer to this, but this is work that just came out from, uh, from Mark Cuthbert and, and others uh, over the past little while and made a bit of a splash with it, that this idea that, that there is this long response time, right? So I think a lot of this was premised on this idea that if climate change and associated changes in agriculture, water shortages, if that's all going to drive changes in groundwater use, we also have to be cognizant that groundwater is also going to change with our changing climate, but that might be at some lag, right? So how that plays out in terms of a, a management uh, a scheme, I, I'm not really sure, but I don't know that we've done a, a good job of figuring out how to manage groundwater with today's climate, never mind thinking about you know, what may or may not happen in the future. So with that, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up and kind of leave you with this idea, right? That, I mean, I think there's a lot of, of thinking to do still about this kind of top-down competition in terms of how water is being used, dropping water tables, nitrate concentrations, other contaminants. That's a problem. But I think we need to think about what's happening from the bottom. What's the ultimate limit? I had this kind of pitched as, well, what's day zero for groundwater when we finally actually hit the bottom, right? Is that a permeability? Is it, is it cost? Is it water chemistry? It's hard to say, but I really am kind of concerned about what, what's going on in terms of what, what's lurking down below. How deep can we go? And a lot of these kind of interactions between deeper groundwater systems and, and what, what's happening through the resource sector, right? Because I think a lot of that has been kind of left behind, right? So we call this the subsurface porosity race, that it's, it's all worth, worth something to somebody, right? But I think in the longer term, it's probably the water resource that we want. So we have to think about how that's going to play out overall. So with that, I'll thank uh, a few of my colleagues. So that would be, I mentioned before, Jennifer McIntosh at Arizona, Scott Jasheko at uh, UCSB, along with Deb Perone, who's also at USB, and uh, Steve Grasby from the Geological Survey of Canada. And of course, I mean, this is uh, a U of S production, so we did have some global water futures money behind it and uh, some support from NSERC. With that, I'll wrap up, and thank you very much. We have time for questions. Anyone? Philip. Philip. It's kind of a detailed question, but you showed this um, depth distribution, frequency distribution of wells in different um, basins. The Wind River Basin was very different in terms of its distribution. You had high frequency down to about five kilometers? Yep. So uh, if you look at the Wind River, it's a very different type of distribution. It, it is. So, and, and this is just where we see basically well screens that we could sample or that have been sampled. So I think what's happening in the Wind River, the, uh, if you go, I think maybe you have to go back to the paper. I don't know if I have it in the earlier slides. I might, but there's brackish water down to several hundred meters. Okay. It's one of the, the deepest, uh, I guess, stores of, of fresh water. And we think there's a story there that, it, this, I guess, the geological history of the Wind River Basin, it never contained evaporites, it never had those, those types of environments, mostly sediments coming down off the mountains, so it was probably full of, you know, maybe seawater at the most. So. And there's, uh, there's other similar basins like that throughout, kind of on the eastern, eastern side of the Rockies throughout uh, Western North America. Anyone else? Dave. Thanks a lot, Grant. Really, really interesting. So, so long we focused on uh, the impact of salt coming from the top as opposed to coming from the bottom, from, from soil salinity, from road salt you mentioned. And so as we look at this moving to the future, it, are we going to see that upper zones s systematically dropping in quality as a result of this, of salt 
getting into the system from the top down, irrigating with slightly more salty water, like the Central Valley in California, is, is that, is that going to catch up with us early so that our shallow freshwater zone becomes a real uh, problem short, in, a, in, a, in a shorter time frame? I think it could, it could come to pass, yeah, especially if we go after, after some of these deeper groundwaters, if that's what we're looking at for salinity, or for, for irrigation, rather. There's actually some examples in, in some of those, uh, I guess, alluvial basins, if you look at kind of basin and range type, type uh, environments in the U.S. Southwest, there actually are basins in, in Arizona where we see salinity high up top, and then there's fresher water at depth. And that's a natural process, so I, I think, yeah, that, that's, and it's just that high evaporative type environment. So I, I think that probably is gonna be something that comes to pass, right? And you can play those kind of space for time games and you know, does Saskatchewan look like Nebraska or Nebraska look like New Mexico or something like that, right? So. More questions? Anyone? Then let's give Grant another round of applause. Thank you very much, Grant, for coming here.